Good evening, everyone. My name is Jill Evans. I'm the director of the Essex Community Justice Center, where I've been for nine years now. I use she, her pronouns. Um, before coming to the Community Justice Center, I retired from the state of Vermont Department of Corrections, where I was the director of women's services. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. For those of you who don't know what a community justice center is, we are funded by the state, by the town of Essex, and by the town of Colchester to provide alternative responses to the criminal legal system for people who've committed crimes and caused harm in our communities. We use restorative approaches to addressing that harm. And we also support people reentering their communities from prison. Many of you probably don't know that 98% of people who go to prison come home one day. So we are convening and holding this community forum because that's another thing that community justice centers do is to engage the community in dialogue. Um, a few bits of information about tonight. Uh, we are in a webinar and it's part of a series of informational sessions uh, that the community justice center has and will be hosting. We held an in-person seminar this past Saturday at the Essex town office and uh, at that, the uh, forum we heard from people who provide services in the facility, our community-based partners, and they talked about some of the programs and services they provide. That session was recorded and there will be a recording available on the Community Justice Center's website as soon as it's available, which should be by the end of the week. Tonight is aimed at starting to provide information to community members about what it means to grapple with the idea of possibly having a correctional facility in our community. I want you to know that I live here in this community as well, and I have some of the same questions as some of you. I also wonder what some of the opportunities are that might exist because of it and that I am not aware of. Important, it's important for the community to be informed and to be involved to the extent that they can be at every step of this process, which is going to be a lengthy one. Part of tonight's forum will be hearing from folks from both Maine and South Burlington about their experiences with having had a women's facility in their communities. The Community Justice Center is a neutral convener um, and we're in it for the long haul. Our commitment is to provide opportunities to inform the community, provide opportunities for the community to ask questions and to get their um, questions answered. I wanna be clear that what the Community Justice Center is doing is completely separate from what will be taking place at the Planning Commission and Select Board. Um, these meetings that we're convening are not meetings where we're gonna talk about whether or not we should build a facility, where it should or shouldn't be located. It is purely a means for bringing community together to keep you informed about where things are in the process and to give you an opportunity to provide voice and ask questions. So a few things about tonight. Tonight, we are in a webinar format, so all of our attendees are muted. We ask that you use the question answer feature at the bottom of your screen for typing in questions for the panelists, not the chat function. There are two facilitators, Karen and Sarah, who will be behind the scenes feeding questions to the panel when the time comes. Today's webinar is focusing on what it means to be a community with a correctional facility. We'll hear from some panelists who present from each of their perspectives. And then after they've each presented, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Our panelists in the order of their presentations are Amanda Wolford, who's the Director of Women's Services from the Maine Department of Corrections, Chief Burke from the South Burlington Police Department, Kristen Culver from the De uh, Department of Corrections, he's the Deputy Commissioner, Al Cormier, who's the Chief of Operations with the Vermont Department of Corrections, and Tabrina Karish, who's the Project Manager for the Department of Buildings and General Services for the State of Vermont. <clears throat> uh, just to let you know that any questions that are not answered by the end of this forum will be saved and inform future forums. We are recording today's discussion and it will, speak, will be available um, on the CJC website as soon as it's available. And if your topic or question that you raise isn't addressed tonight, you can also visit the website that's listed on the slide that I don't know if is, it's being shown now, but we can make sure to show it again. It's um, a website for the Vermont Women's Facility Replacement Project. So uh, that's all I have to say to open this up. I will hand it over to Amanda Wolford from Maine.
Jill, can you hear me okay? Okay, uh, it's telling me I can't uh, use my video function for some reason. Can folks hear Amanda? Yes. Okay, I will get started um, without my video, um, unless the host can change that for for me. Um, just let me know, I'll turn that back on. Um, but I am here um, smiling at all of you, I promise. Um, so my name is Amanda Wolford. I am the Director of Women's Programs for the Maine Department of Corrections. I've been with DOC for almost 20 years, uh, specifically working with women uh, involved in our justice system. Um, as I speak, there will be some slides that kind of go behind me that show actual pictures of our facility. Um, right now you're looking at the pre-release. Um, this is a 100-bed facility uh, in our Wyndham community. Uh, this was built in 2017. Uh, and gave us the ability to really expand um, our programming services and offerings to our, our women's population. As Jill mentioned in her opening, the 90% um, of our population is returning into our community. So it's really important that we prepare these women uh, to go back into those communities in the best way that we can. Um, the facilities that we had occupied prior were just very antiquated and didn't um, offer the programming space. Um, and that is because corrections wasn't always as forward thinking as we are now. Uh, we were about uh, housing folks, warehousing folks and keeping the community safe and not really about treating the folks um, and giving them the correct programming that they needed to reenter these our, our communities uh, and not return to us. Uh, we really understood that we needed to be forward thinking and really look at other models that were happening around the country when we built this facility. This is, um, in my tenure, our third reentry center. So we have moved um, in three different into three different communities. Um, this being obviously our largest and hopefully most sustainable building that we have. Um, but again, because of 90% of our population is going back into the community, we really needed to have a robust um, plan for them. And uh, having them released from a fenced facility really was not um, leveraging the results we wanted in terms of recidivism numbers. Uh, so giving us the programming space, uh, which means meeting rooms, which means accessibility to technology, this. Uh, facility that you're looking at right now on the screen was the first facility in our DOC, so in Maine's DOC, to be fully wired for Wi-Fi. So that means students can log onto their computers in any space uh, and continue their education. This was really pivotal during COVID, um, and I'm so fortunate that we had the foresight to have this wired before COVID hit because we did not have to stop programming because of COVID. We were able to set up in any space. We were able to distance ourselves. Uh, and because of that, we had very low uh, COVID numbers. Uh, we had zero um, deaths and only one hospitalization in the state um, because of this. So uh, very fortunate to have that foresight. We do on the same campus, and I, I believe that's the idea for Vermont as well, uh, we have a um, co-located facility, which is up to, um, it's right behind this building actually, um, probably 200 yards away, uh, a fence facility. So that's our, really our diagnostic center. So women go through that facility first and are um, evaluated. They are evaluated for substance use. They are evaluated for mental health treatment. They are evaluated uh, for educational needs, vocational needs, job placements, um, all, all things that will help them be successful um, along their journey. And from there, we develop a plan uh, and then we move them into the appropriate housing um, facility, whether that be a fence facility because of the length of their sentence, or they can move down to the reentry center within just a few weeks of intake. Um, but we really wanna make sure that that comprehensive um, process happens uh, to make sure that they get all the uh, evaluations that, that they truly need um, so that that plan is really holistic and hits all the markers for that, for that individual. Um, so that's one fortunate, oh, I think my camera's fixed. Let me, let's see, oh, do you see me? Okay, hi, um, sorry about that. Uh, so that's one 
um, I would say positive thing about being co-located and, and being so close together is that movement between the facilities is very easy. Um, having events for the women, um, we can do some cross uh, pollination with that and, and really be efficient with our resources. And um, again, make movement uh, a lot quicker. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this is a hundred bed facility um, and it is typically full. We do see a lot lower risk with our women. So they are more eligible for these types of programs, these unfenced facility programs. Um, so I, I, again, I'm fortunate that we were able to have the capacity to move women who don't necessarily need to be behind a fence because, um, you know, statistics tell us that women are not, uh, are not violent offenders. Women don't escape from prisons. Um, so we, this was a very calculated risk that we took um, and we're having really great results with it. Um, the communities have always been very welcoming of us. Like I said, I, we've had to move this rear entry center three times because it's expanded. Um, and it, that old adage of once we know better, do better. So, you know, we started with a very small 34 bed program and we just kept having to expand based on need. Um, each time we have moved into a new community, our biggest supporters are the community that we're moving from. We have actually had community members from that community volunteer to say, hey, I'll come talk to, you know, when we moved into the town of Wyndham, the folks from, from York County came up and said, you want this here and here's why. Um, and a few of those reasons were, we offered an employment base for small businesses, local businesses in the area. We offered a, a stable employment. Uh, the Our policy states that women can go out to work at the two year mark. So you basically have an employee for, for two years if you'd like them, um, if they qualify for that. Um, they're somebody who is reliable. They show up to work every single day. They have a ride. We make sure that, of that. They are sober um, and they're getting, every, you know, all the treatment that they need. Um, so they're in a really good space to be a really good employer, uh, employee. Uh, we have a lot of prep programs that go into that, soft skills. And again, because of the programming space, we're able to really prep these individuals to go into our communities and really be productive members of these communities. Uh, there's a horse farm right across the street from this. Um, our, this facility is, uh, you know, state properties are usually in the middle of fields. So this property is in the middle of a field and across the street um, is a horse farm that's been there for over a hundred years. Um, and it, um, it is a horse rescue. So what we do sometimes is if the women don't have a long work history is our partnership um, for volunteer base is give the women some experience with volunteering. The horse farm is just one example of that. We do some some work with parks and recreation in, in our towns, you know, walking trails, painting gazebos and cleaning up parks, things like that. Um, so they really have opportunities um, to get out into the community um, and again, give back to that community. Um, another great thing is that we we bring jobs, we bring good paying jobs, we bring state um, retirement to, to that community, we bring um, insurance uh, and um, you know health insurance and, and wellness programs. Um, so it's a good employee, employee we're a good employer. Um, again, it's a stable uh, job. We're not going out of business anytime soon. So those are some of the things that we bring to the community. Um, I will pause here because I've hit my 10 minute mark and I don't want to cut into everybody else, but uh, certainly happy to take questions um, at the end. Um, but uh, that will be my time. Thank you. Jill, are you going to transition us from speaker to speaker? Yes. Next, we will hear from Chief Burke from the South Burlington Police Department. Good evening, thanks for having me in this evening. <clears throat> My name is Sean Burke. I do have the privilege of serving as the police chief in South Burlington. I've spent uh, the last 30 years in, in municipal law enforcement in the state. 27 of those have been right here in Chittenden County. So I'm uh, very familiar with uh, the current site at Chittenden Regional on Farrell Street, which is nestled right in at the intersection of Swift Street, if you're not familiar. The uh, correctional facility is a single level building. It is, uh, it is noticeable by the fencing that goes around it. 
However, the neighborhood has been uh, a center for a lot of growth here in South Burlington. Headquartered across the street is Vermont Gas. Across uh, Farrell Street from the facility is Clinger's Bakery, just for uh, further reference. Farrell Street extends back toward uh, Shelburne Road in the city of South Burlington. And that area has been a center for a lot of residential growth. There's uh, upwards of 500 apartment units there, as well as uh, Edge Fitness, Edge Fitness and Kids program and Rice Memorial High School. The, uh, the building is fairly unremarkable to uh, the neighborhood and is not a site for uh, disorder that we respond to. And I can talk a little bit more about our data on the next slide. So the graph here reflects the number of times the South Burlington Police Department has responded to uh, the, the Chittenden Regional Correctional Center. The numbers may be a little shocking at first, but let me give you the context behind this. So um, the lion's share of these incidents are uh, instances where other agencies, be it the family court, another police department, or a criminal court asks us to go and serve uh, court paperwork, be that a subpoena, an abuse prevention order, or very similar occurrences. What's not reflected here are any response to crimes that occur within the facility itself. The Vermont State Police is responsible for any criminal activity that occurs within the confines of the uh, center itself. And you'll see uh, the presenters may be blocking a little bit, but in more recent years, our responses have ranged between uh, 33 and 42 incidents per year. And I have uh, personally checked those to ensure that those are in large number paperwork services on behalf of the court. Next slide. This graph kind of highlight, it does highlight our fire EMS responses to the property. We do have a career fire and EMS based service here in South Burlington. Their work as it pertains to the center are ambulance responses. The small number of responses that you can see here highlighted in the red portion of the bar graph or the orange portion of the bar graph are actual fire calls. Those I understand from the fire chief are alarm activations and few in number. There, is, uh, there was a conundrum in terms of the ability of our fire department to bill Medicaid, Medicare for the transport services. The city of South Burlington has uh, worked that out and is able to uh, effectively bill the respective insurance entities for the transports that they're doing from the center. Next slide. This graph is uh, not my area of expertise, but I will tell you that in lieu of property taxes, that this state property, like many other state property, has a pilot uh, payment, which is payment in lieu of taxes. The graph simply is uh, a reflection of what the state pays the city of South Burlington for the facility here um, and the related municipal support that goes uh, toward it. So if that's all you have, Chief Burke, then next we will be going to Kristen Calver. Hi, thanks, Jill. I'm Kristen Calver, Deputy Commissioner for DOC. I'm new to the role, but I've been with DOC for about 20 years now. Um, and I have Chief Cormier with me to walk you through the next few slides, just to give you a general overview of DOC in general. Good afternoon. I'm Al Cormier, the Chief of Operations with the Department of Corrections. Um, overview of the Department of Corrections. We're a unique entity across the country as a, uh, an, a department that is housed within the Agency of Human Services. Most correctional agencies across the country are housed under, under public safety or under their own entity. Um, this is a benefit for Vermont as being housed with, within the agency and, and the partnerships within other AHS departments. Um, gives us a, a, a more holistic approach to how we serve our population. We are also a unified system. We have no county uh, lockups or county probation within um, Vermont. Vermont houses detainees, 
sentenced individuals as well as our community supervision, which are our probation and parole offices. We have six in-state facilities, um, five men's facilities and the, and the one women's facility within, uh, currently housed in, in Burlington. Um, our probation and parole offices, we have 12 of those located throughout the state and our training academy is located in Lindenville, Vermont. Uh, we currently operate on a, approximately a $200 million a year budget, which is 98% general funded. Um, and we hold approximately a, a thousand staff within our ranks. And to uh, Amanda Wolford's previous comment, you know, we, we are an excellent employer. Um, although as, as many law enforcement and public service agencies are, are struggling with staffing, um, we do offer a great benefit package to our staff um, and much, much like Amanda highlighted for the, the main department of corrections. Um, the next slide you'll see where Vermont, we rank as one of the lowest uh, states in the country around incarceration ranks. Um, one third the national rate, our current population today is 112 in our women's facility. Our total population uh, that we have incarcerated currently is 1,411 as of today, um, and approximately 500 of those numbers are detainees um, held by the court. Um, I think one thing to highlight that's important is, is the Department of Corrections has very little control over who comes through our door. Um, those that are held within our facilities are held by courts. They're lodged by local law enforcement agencies um, and they're sentenced by the courts. Um, we do have a, a furlough population and, and we do see some returns from our, our field staff with, with probation and parole violations, but the majority of the population is is held by, by the court and the judiciary, not by um, the Department of Corrections. You'll see with this graph, um, population over the last 10 years, you'll see where it's, it's reduced pretty drastically over the last 10 years. Um, obviously, during COVID, we saw a, a drastic reduction where we were um, getting more people out of our system across the, the entire state. Um, and then over the last two years where we've seen a, a slight increase um, with that average population being 114. And as I, I just mentioned, um, we're at 112 today. You'll see that broken down by um, the average sentence population and the average detainee population. Current conditions at, at CRCF, these are a, a few photos that we have. You'll see it's a very much a brick and mortar building. Um, it looks like a typical correctional facility, um, bars, steel, bland colors, um, the living arrangement you'll see here, this is a four person cell at, at CRCF currently, uh, four women held in this one room sharing um, bunk well the, the bunk space the uh the storage space you can see in the in the yellow lockers the the uh, the lighting is is poor poor um not a lot of natural light that natural light is also obstructed by by the steel bars um you'll see a very small desk where the the women can do some of their their work and programming work and, and so forth um just not an ideal situation for a, a rehabilitative environment Um, deferred maintenance costs, you'll see here where uh, ceiling tiles missing. Um, those have since been replaced, but we, we do have um, a, a large deferred maintenance cost associated with maintaining this building, which was built in 1971. Um, so we're, we're continuously doing work to, to maintain and, and try to um, improve and, and maintain the standards of, of this facility to the best that we can. Replacement facility. So this is this is why we're here. We're looking um, at a, a utilizing a very much an evidence based design. Um, you'll see in this this rendering here, um, natural light, um, high ceilings, very open concept, um, similar to an office setting or a college campus setting. Uh, these these are the uh, the designs that we're looking at as we move forward in potentially building a new a new women's facility. You'll see in these pictures, what we're looking at is, is based on the Scandinavian model of corrections. Um, these are examples of, of a facility in Scandinavia. Um, again, much open light, natural light, trees, nature, um, amazing program space, 
This is a, a dining hall, again, much like a, a college campus, um, the natural light with a, the nature background, um, much more therapeutic and inviting than, than the current facility that we, we house our women in. Um, I think these are a lot of the same slides that, that Amanda went through, through the, the main system. Um, again, something that we're looking to model our, our new building off from. This is uh, the uh, River Valley Therapeutic Residence. It's currently located in Essex. Um, this was um, recently opened within within the last 18 months or so. Um, again, this is a model that we're looking to um, mimic as, as we build ours with, with the open concept design, natural wood, natural light, um, much more inviting spaces, um, does not feel like a a mental health facility or a correctional facility, much more inviting to the, the population and, and also the staff that work there. Um, I think at this point, we'll turn it over to, to, to Brina to talk about the site search and our partnership with BGS and how that's worked. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sabrina Karish. I am a project manager for buildings and general services, as well as an architect. Just to touch on a few concepts from the slides that Al just went over. So our vision for this facility is to create a facility that enhances individuals' well-being through evidence-based design. Evidence-based design started in healthcare and long-term treatment programs, where they found that your environment has an effect on your health and your ability to heal both mental and physical trauma. These concepts transfer to the corrections environment as corrections moves to a treatment-based model to improve outcomes and reduce recidivism. So evidence-based design principles are similar to trauma-informed design. They include calming color palettes, natural light, sensitivity to sound, connect connection to nature, both bringing nature inside and the connection to outside space, occupant comfort, um, you know, this ability to, to you know, control heat, air conditioning, et cetera. Um, this improves well-being for both incarcerated individuals and staff. So for a site search, we reviewed um, all state of Vermont property. That was over 400 sites. We also put it an RFP for privately owned properties. We received about 25 sites through that process. Um, so altogether, we looked at, we did a deep dive into 125 sites. From those sites, we ended up with four that made the shortlist. Oh, if you could just stay on this slide for one second here. <laughs> um, two of those sites are in Essex. Uh, we were not targeting Essex specifically. It just so happens that that was where we owned state-owned land. Of these four sites, one of those sites was privately owned. Uh, site three was the privately owned site. That was eliminated um, um, because of its location didn't quite meet our needs. Site four is another state-owned site. It was outside of um, the ideal area and it was a better suit for another state facility that we're also citing this year. So our first site, these sites are in no particular order. Site one, this is at the end of 289. Um, this is land that the state owns that was for the Cirque Highway project. Our, Facility would be south of that cert highway right away. There's quite a great difference here between the residential area and the site. The second site here is off of River Road um, within sight of the, um, what was it, Williston Road intersection here. And once again, we'd be at the top of this site. There's also a big grade difference between River Road and our site, our facility. And so I just wanted to show you where our existing facility is. This is our existing facility right here. Oops, it's a little hard to draw with my mouse here. <laughs> this is the Rice Memorial High School. Um, this is less than a mile uh, walking distance between the two. There's also a school down here, Orchard School. You can see a large residential area here with walking paths between these two facilities. This facility, this school is also within a mile of the facility. This is Farrell Street Park that houses a large number of children's sports fields. And this is, uh, Clearance Bakery is right here. And this is a children's dance studio here. Um, these are just two shots of the, that intersection. 
Um, this is our facility right here in the corner here. Um, this is a residential area right here. There's some residential, some small commercial. Um, this intersection, you're see seeing Farrell Street Park over here and Clinger's Bakery right here and that dance studio. So our facilities are, you know, this facility is already in a community. Um, we also have another facility in Rutland that is in a, in a community uh, right next to a walking path and in very close proximity to an elementary school. And I believe that is our last slide. Wonderful. Thank you to all of the panelists that we have. So I am Karen. I also work at the Essex Community Justice Center with Jill. And I have been in the background trying to coordinate some of the pieces and also monitoring the questions. So um, we do have some questions that are um, been put into the Q&A box, but I will just take this um, moment to remind folks if you have other questions that um, you haven't put in yet to please add them to the Q&A box. And again, if for some reason we don't get through them tonight, they will help to inform us for um, future conversations and gatherings that we might have. So what I what my plan is, is that I'm going to um, uh, pose a question and I will try to do my best to refer it to one of our panelists um, if I choose wrong, you know, feel free to say so, and we can hand it to somebody else. But then after the initial person answers the question, we can open it up to see if anybody else uh, has a response that they'd like to go to. Um, thoughts or questions on that from the panelists before we begin? Okay, not hearing anything, so perfect. So um, looking at um, the questions and really appreciate Amanda uh, zooming in from Maine um, to share about the Maine facility as that was mentioned that it is going to be a potential model for this new facility. And um, somebody had a question. Um, I have heard that Maine's model is already being dismantled. Can you speak to what has changed since first implementing this model? So I guess Amanda, if you can speak to, is that correct? Um, is um, and is, has things have things changed since you first started the program? Yeah, I'm not sure what um, uh, the dismantling might be. However, I will say that um, about a year, a little over a year ago, um, the beginning of 2023, we did have a pretty uh, big uh, administration change here in Maine. So one of uh, you know a real big champion and really the, the co-creator um, with a few of us of the main model of corrections, um, Dr. Ryan Thornell, um, he was our deputy commissioner at the time, um, did leave to take over the Department of Corrections in Arizona. Uh, so who, there was some shift in administration um, and with that comes different priorities. Uh, and so is there prerogative to, to have those priorities. And I'm sure there's conversations with the governor and the commissioner that I'm not privy to. Um, so I, you know, specifically to my position, and I think that was one of the, you know, things that had maybe come up specifically to the, the, um, the women's center uh, and the reentry center, uh, they wanted my position to be more um, statewide, meaning to be as a, of assistance to the county jails. Um, and other um, state agencies um, as, as it pertains to women's services. So that's what I've kind of shifted my role. So there are different individuals running the actual programs on site where I have more um, of a central office role now. Um, so I'm, I, I'm guessing that's what um, the question might pertain to in terms of uh, shifts uh, in, in the model itself. Uh, so I'm not, on the floor every single day uh, dealing with daily operations. Um, but I think the overarching ideas of what both uh, Vermont and Maine want is um, looking at these Scandinav Scandinavian models, really seeding our, our decision-making in evidence-based practices 
knowing that 98% of our population is going back into our communities. Um, and I know that that is, uh, you know, I've, I've spent probably the better part of five years interacting with different uh, folks from the legislature and uh, the Department of Corrections and even the University of Vermont, who is very interested uh, in this project. And I know they really want uh, a better path forward uh, for the women of Vermont. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be partners. We have a very, as when Al showed you the, the crime rates, we have very similar incarceration rates. So I think uh, it's been very helpful to be so close in proximity. We've been able to share ideas and, and, and such. So um, really pleased with, uh, you know, Commissioner and, and the Deputy Commissioner um, Culver um, and, and their progress moving moving this project forward because I think it's it's needed as you saw in the in the pictures um, of the the facility built in the 70s it's just not conducive to programming um, and and the ideals of what corrections is trying to be. Great, thank you, Amanda. I appreciate it. Um, I don't think that's one to hand off to other people because that was a main specific one, but looking to see if anybody is interested, okay? So this question um, came up, I think, during your piece, Amanda. So maybe you could share a bit, but then I think it's also relevant to the current facility. It is, do you offer both academic classes as well as classes such as economic security, personal security, how to deal with abusive situations, practical classes? Um, and I will just add one piece that I think Jill mentioned in the intro that we did have a um, presentation this past weekend, and that was specifically with the service providers that are at the Women's Correctional Facility, and they shared about the, a lot of the programs and classes there. So in addition to what you'll hear as answers tonight, we will be sharing that recording of it, um, one that's available through CCTV. So Amanda, if you'd like to share what kind of programming you have, and then we can let somebody from DOC do that as well. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, as I mentioned in, in, in my portion, um, a very holistic approach. So that means treating the entire person and really meeting them where they're at and finding what interests them to help drive them. So yeah, our classes do address you know, things that have happened in their past, substance use, personal decision-making, boundary setting, relationships, uh, practical skills like budgeting, things like that. Um, but we have a huge um, educational program um, and really proudly hang our hat on a 0% recidivism rate for women who have obtained any level of education within our department, whether that be an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, or high school equivalency. Um, I think that's really the key to laying the groundwork um, for their futures is really obtaining those skills that make them employable in jobs that are a living wage rather than minimum wage, um, because we know that jobs uh, and housing are really the two biggest factors from keeping, especially women, uh, out of our facilities. So yes, to that question, it has to be a whole person approach um, to be successful. So um, yes, um, absolutely. And that's, that's paramount to our programming. We are also, it does, not everybody is on a college track and we recognize that. So vocational programming um, is also very important. We have um, classes, actually we take the women off site uh, to a community college and we have a partnership with them for HVAC and for welding. Uh, we have a CDL class going on right now. Uh, so really just constantly polling the women that we have in our facilities to see what interests them and what is something that's gonna drive them um, to be successful. Thanks, Amanda. And I don't know, Al, would it be you to cover it from Vermont DOC perspective? Yes, I can take that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very similar to, to what Amanda said, we do offer um, educational programs. We have a, a certified high school um, within the Vermont DOC, the Community High School of Vermont is an accredited high school program where people are actually able to earn their, their high school diploma. We do offer um, GED classes, and we've recently partnered with CCV for college credit classes um, within our correctional facilities as well. And I know we do have a number of women that have taken advantage of, of those programs. Um, so not only do we have the academic piece where we're starting to stand up and improve our vocational training offerings as well, similar to what Amanda talked about in um, portable labs for welding uh, certification, 
Um, we have heard some interest in, in the HVAC and some other technical programs currently in the process of, of trying to partner with some of the local CTEs to offer those classes, as well as our own staff within the facility in those mobile labs. Um, again, carpentry, HVAC, the welding component. Um, but there's also the the risk reduction programming that we offer um, for for the women. You know, we do a, a risk needs assessment of, of the women and then look at at, at their needs for um, programming in it, whether it's substance use disorder, whether it's it's a violence component, whether it's parenting. Um, we have Jess Kell and the Kids Apart program within our facility that's that's really working to bring women and their children back together, re reunification um and, and parenting skills um the uh, the vermont network is is present every day in in that facility um offering classes for women who have been um victims and survivors of of abuse situations and and helping them through that uh so we we do have pretty robust programming within the facility now we just don't have a lot of good space for it um and that that's something we're looking at as we design this new facility is around increasing programmatic offerings and programmatic space um, for for the women within that facility. Thank you for that, Al. Um, so since we're in kind of the service and um, provider type piece, I think I'm going to stick with this theme. And then it looks like we have some questions that are related, related to like the need of a facility and the siting of it. So um, to finish up this topic, um, the question is, and I think this will be for you, Al, again, is uh, how will this new facility better support visitation opportunities between incarcerated women and their families? Great. Yes. Um, so again, you know, looking at the the design of the, of this facility, we're looking at at the the family visitation room, um, expanding the the um, space for the kids apart program, offering a more family friendly visitation area for for people coming in to, to see their loved ones, friends, family, um, and really enhance that experience. So it is more therapeutic that, that it is a trauma informed experience. It's not people sitting at a big metal table with a divider in between them, preventing them from holding each other's hand or, or, or so forth. Like we, we want to make it as rehabilitative as we can and, and as welcoming as we can. So that is something that we are looking at. Thank you. And then another one came in on this topic, so I'm going to slide it in before we switch, okay. is, um, and I think this gets to the mental health services that um, are offered. Somebody is asking, what percent of residents who enter a uh, facility um, have mental health diagnosis, mental health concerns, and what are the number of cl clinicians that are available on site to work with that? Or I guess clinicians and services. Yep. Um, so I, I don't have the the actual percentage of of the population that that is receiving mental health services now. I know that it's a high number for sure, as well as with our our um, MAT program, the the medically assisted treatment. Um, we have a, a high number of of those um, incarcerated individuals as well. But with our our men, medical and mental health contractor, um, they do provide a comprehensive medical services. Um, we are one of the largest. Um, medical providers in the state um, behind UVM um, with our, our population and, and the facilities where, where we house our population. Um, but we have, we have a, a robust mental health um, staff through what, through the WellPath contract, as well as our medical staff um, and the, the substance use disorder staff. So we, we do offer those programs through, uh, through the WellPath contract. Thank you for that. And this may be this next question, again, sticking with this theme for a bit while well, questions are popping up on it, could go to Amanda as well, because I think this came up, Amanda, during your piece of talking about how there is um, one of the benefits of having um, uh, a pipeline of employees is that you said that they would be sober employees like you would. And so somebody asked, how is sobriety monitored? So I think maybe for you to answer that from your facility's perspective, and then Al, maybe you can share how that is done for Vermont? Sure. So um, obviously we do randomized testing. We would test upon suspicion. Um, but if someone comes in with a significant substance use issue, um, we're not putting them out to work on day one, right? We're, we're, we're doing some treatment. We're getting maybe MAT on board if that's, that's something that they're interested in and it's appropriate for them. 
Um, so those things are all put in place first before um, they go out. Um, we also, you know, one of the things that we really want, um, and I think this should be said because I think it's important because I think this is where Vermont's head is at as well. The facilities are fantastic. It's the culture within them. It's what kind of culture are we supporting? And, and these facilities with light and space, it's saying that this is important and, and you are you are worthy of treatment and getting better and being well. Um, so the space is, 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 is part of it, but it's a culture of the staff and really what we wanna implement and really emphasize with our population is come to us. If you're feeling, you know, you, you have been out to work, let's say for two weeks, but something happened at work or, or something was triggering, let's have that conversation ahead of time. You know, we don't want to, you to have a slip and it, it set you back. We wanna work through that. Um, and offer the services that we need to up front um, to get you back, uh, you know, on your feet and and not feel it might be the place and maybe it's it's not um, you know the right fit job for you. So it's constant eyes on and constant support. Like coming back, like I have a really rough day. Can we talk about this instead of like, oh, you know, when I used to have a rough day, I'd come home and have a drink. No, we're going to come home and we're going to process what happened at work that day. Um, so again, up front, we're offering that treatment. We're offering that MAT to get them to a place where, where we can, you know, try community-based things. Like I said, sometimes it's, we start with a, a volunteering schedule a few days a week, and then we open up to, to full-blown employment um, where they're out of the facility up to 40 hours a week um, and on their own. But they have a safety net. They have staff and counselors and treatment providers to come back to to say, I had a rough day. I feel really triggered. Can you help me work through this? And I'll let Al take it from there. Yeah. No, I, I would echo a lot of, of what Amanda just said. Like the, the wraparound services are, are very important. Um, the the communication with the caseworker, the communication with the mental health clinician, the communication with the, the treatment providers that are coming in from the community such as Vermont Works for Women, the network, and Kids Apart. Um, those are all resources for the women coming back, whether they're they're going to work or they they go out and, and they have an unsuccessful reentry and they come back in. Those those resources are important to monitor, to to support, to communicate, um, and ensure they're getting the the services they need to be successful. Thank you both. Um, I'm realizing I haven't opened it up to anybody else. I, maybe what it is, is if folks put their screen on, that will indicate to me that you want to be added to uh, respond to a certain question. Um, but right now, it seems like it's the Al and Amanda show. This is great. Um, so I'm seeing a couple questions. Uh, I think this is to you, Al, of um, concerns about staffing, whether it's staffing for the medical service that, that are being provided you know, with the new facility or maybe even at the current facility and also with um, officers. Um, I think how I'm hearing these questions is, you know, how is this all going to be done? These things sound yeah. like great ideas, but um, there are staffing concerns now and how are staffing concerns going to be addressed um, down the road? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, like like many other agencies within within the state and even even private businesses, we we struggle with staffing. Um, staffing challenges exist across this country, um, both in the public and private sectors, in the medical field. Um, we we do struggle with that. Um, I think we've we've done a good job in Chittenden um, with with the the staff we have. Do we need more? Absolutely. I think one thing that's that's important for us though is looking at our community providers and those programmatic providers where that population of staff has been very consistent. Um, we don't see a lot of turnover. Um, the recruitment efforts in, in that realm is, is really good. Um, and those services are much different than, than being a correctional officer themselves. Um, but part of our, our goal in, in, in building a new facility local to the current one is maintaining those staff. Um, that's important for us is to main, maintain the staff that we currently have. Um, we're also hopeful that with a new facility, we may not need as many staff. Um, we have very small living units within within the CRCF facility now um, that hold 20 to 30 women. If two, two 20 bed units takes six staff a day to operate, if we have one 
50 bed unit, then it's one, you know, it's three people a day to, to do it. So like a, a larger living unit, larger um, space for the, where, where the women would reside will result in, in less staff. And in a more therapeutic environment, to Amanda's earlier comment, culture is key. Um, it's hard to build a new culture and improve culture with a very old building. Um, it's like living in a basement apartment and then moving to the penthouse. You're probably going to feel a little bit better when you move up to the penthouse. And, and that's where we're at right now. And um, having that that therapeutic environment and that rehabilitative environment with, with that natural light and, and more space will, will certainly help with that, both for the, for our staff retention and for the, the population and their experience while they're with us. Thanks, Al. Amanda, I don't know if you um, are interested in speaking to any of the um, things that you do in Maine to address uh, staffing concerns. Um, I will just, you know, I think it's important to state that, you know, what Al just said about the light and, you know, the facilities, the newer facilities have brought a quality of life for our staff as well. They are more proud to come to work. You know, they're, they're not spending their days moving trash cans around because there's leaks in the ceiling. Um, you, you know, they're, they're not, they're locked in the box for 12 hours a day as well. If they're not, you know, having natural light and having outdoor space um, and spaces for them that are, you know, welcoming, you know, if the staff don't feel welcome when they walk in the door, why are they going to stay? Um, so, you know, as much as the population needs these updated facilities, our staff do too. Um, and to Al's point, if we want to keep them around, we need to give them a sense of pride in the work that they do. Um, and yes, you know, a lot of these spaces are a lot better site. So we, you do, you need a lot less staff for a lot of other spaces. So you can redeploy your resources, right? That's what justice reinvestment is, is really all about. So instead of having six officers, Al can now take half of those officers and turn them into you know, community programs coordinators that help find this population work. So it's not about, you know, removing jobs. It's about reducing the the need in certain places and, and bolstering programming in other places and giving those officers um, expansion uh, you know, opportunities and, and places to move up and out and, and, and really flex their own skills. You know, some people don't want to be an officer forever. They want to try out case management. They want to try out community-based services. And this really gives the opportunity to do that. Great. Thank you both for that. Uh, I'm going to switch gears. I think this is going to bring in a new voice. I think it's going to bring in Tabrina because uh, it's going to talk about some of the sighting pieces. I'm seeing some questions about the location. Um, it looks like the um, environmental impact of it. Um, like folks are looking for the exact location because it might be right next to their their driveway. And somebody was also talking about the school. I don't know, Tabrina, if you can, I don't know if you're the person to speak to, what are some of the things that um, need to consider in siting? Um, and what are some of the upcoming decisions that are gonna be made? Um, about that. If you can speak a little bit more to that. And I don't know if you've seen these questions too. I can I can ask them specifically, but I figure I'd start with that. Sure. So we had some very long questions here. Um, so we are at the site selection phase of this. We've not selected a site yet. We don't have a preference. Um, we're we're waiting to see, you know, what the town if the town has a has a has a direction they'd like us to go in. Um, so we have not designed this facility yet. We do have a a very conceptual design, basically of just the spaces that we need and the approximate footprint it would take up. Um, I see a question about a slide that we showed at um, the planning commission meeting on the bad environmental impact rating. So that looked at the entire site. For, this is for site one. Um, that entire site is about is over 300 acres. Um, there was some wetlands, and with those wetlands, there was some endangered species and plant life. Um, our facility is not in that portion of the site. So that's why that site is still acceptable to us. Um, both sites were considered wildlife corridors. Um, and what you're looking for with that is neither one of our conceptual footprints would completely cut off that wildlife corridor. So that wildlife corridor it would still remain, just become smaller. Um, there was a question very specific to someone's property um, on the 289 site one. Um, we, like I said, we have not officially designed this yet. There's about four options of where we could enter this site from. 
the most likely option is probably realigning the intersection of um, landfill lane with the stoplight and entering our site that way. Thanks. And if anyone would like more specifics on 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 the building location relative to, to their specific um, residence, if you email me at that address on the website, I will I, I can get back to you with more specific details. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, the other question, I think somebody was noticing that um, when we we're talking about the um, I think it was the South Burlington facility of saying like it's was near a school, it's near businesses. And I think somebody was asking, is that a positive? Is that a negative? Um, so I don't know if it's you to answer if we want DOC, but I think I think they're trying to say, and I see that Chief Burke went on. So maybe we'll have him start with it of what are the things that are important to consider when you are citing a facility? So citing is outside of my expertise, but I can tell you that you know the current facility lives within a very vibrant residential and commercial district within the city of South Burlington, no really detractions whatsoever. And so I can speak a little bit to that. So in this, with, with citing this facility, we had a little different requirements than we have in the last two facilities we cited, which were both men's facilities, because we have that re-entry component um, and also because we do want to improve visitation for families. So we are looking for a facility that's on a bus route um, and that is close to communities that, that provide employment opportunities for those women. Um, the women will not have their own transportation, so they're relying on public transportation or uh, another private transportation, Uber, taxis, et cetera. Thank you both for that. Um, so I'm switching gears again. I think this is going to bring Al back on. Um, somebody asked, uh, I think this might have been addressed in talking about the need for this facility, but I think it's helpful to clarify of, can we explore just building a re-entry center? Are both both buildings needed? Yeah, I, I, I mean, we've talked about that, but again, going back to the, the condition of the current facility, um, the, the entire thing needs to be, needs to be replaced. It's just, it's not a conducive environment for rehabil re rehabilitative services. Um, you know, the, the reentry piece is something that historically we, we've dabbled in, in in years past in, in letting um, the incarcerated individuals out to work and, and trying to pr prepare them better for reentry. Um, but we have a fair number of, of women currently incarcerated that have 5, 10, 15, 20 years some life sentences currently in in our in our facilities and and those those women just would would not be the ideal candidate for for a reentry facility so i think the 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 short answer is no we can't just do a, a reentry facility we we need a, a better correctional facility um both from an environmental piece the the internal environment culture component um programmatic availability program availability and offerings and and getting these women ready for when they do find you know when they when they eventually they do qualify for the reentry but we we still need a, a correctional facility i'll just and jump I in i'm not sure oh. sorry karen um uh, you know i'm not sure if they're the question's getting at like is there a need for a fence facility um but you know, to that question, yeah, absolutely. And and because of what the prison really is, it's really a, a, an end-all be-all treatment facility for, for those who are uh, acutely mentally ill, for those who, um, you know, are, do, do have violent crimes. Yes, of course, women do have a lot lower rate of violent crimes, but they do still do exist. Um, and I've had instances where we do get a woman in, we stabilize her, uh, we, we've we provided treatment and medication, and she's in a really good place. We get her down to the reentry center. She's been out to work, um, and something happens. You know, she's feeling good. She decides to take herself off her medication because medication is voluntary, um, and she goes back into psychosis, and we have to move her back to a fence facility for safety reasons, not because we want to punt. It's not a punishment but I can't have her walk out the door and into the streets. Um, so we do have to also provide that public safety. Um, so that's why I think the proximity, like Vermont's talking about having them on the same campus is, is a conducive idea because you have that 
um, quick response. You can get them back stabilized and and back down, um, you know, and back on their feet. Because again, this is this is how their life is going to be. So we really need um, to normalize this as much as possible and only keep them behind the fence as long as we need to. Um, but we do still need to provide public safety. Uh, and if it's not for their crime itself, it's because of their, you know, really acute mental illness. So um, I, I just want to make be clear about like, yes, there is still a need um, for a fence facility. Um, and because you are a unified system, you have folks who are not, um, not sentenced um, and they're not yet in a place where they're, they're like, hey, I'm, I'm willing to take the treatment and get better. I'm going to scram the minute I, I get the chance and, you know, you'll see me in San Juan de Nail. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I just want to my 20 years of experience just say that I think there still is a need um, just because our mental um, health crisis in our communities is not getting any better. And unfortunately, we're the de facto treatment facility um, when, when the, the public just doesn't have any other answers. Thanks, Amanda. Sabrina, did you want to add to that? Sure, I can talk a little bit more about the building side of why we're looking to re replace Chittenden. So the building is 50 years old. We're at the point where we need to replace major building systems, where, you know, we need to replace the HVAC. We're having issues with the water supply, piping that's in, you know, in masonry walls. We're also having issues with um, drainage and sewer drains in the slab. And so we're looking at a major renovation um, over $10 million, and that's still, we still don't have the space we need to properly provide the services needed for these women. Um, and then there's also the logistics of we would have to re replace, remove the women from that facility to somewhere else while we did that work. And so that's you know, getting a little more into the building side of why we're looking at a new facility. Thanks for that, Tabrina. And Tabrina, I'm going to keep you on. Um, I don't want us to fully go down this because I don't know how relevant it is to the full topic, um, but there seems to be um, some questions about the, um, uh, what am I, the environmental impact piece of it. And so I know though there's a lot of decisions and a lot of process for that to be confirmed. Can you just share a bit about what some of the steps are, the process, or if somebody is concerned about that topic, what are the meetings in ways that folks can get mm -hmm. those types of answers? Sure. So this is just the beginning of probably a three year permitting process. So both sites would have to go through Act 250, which requires an environmental impact study. Um, so right now we've just done preliminary studies to see if there are any major red flags that would prevent either of these sites from being developed. And so as we go further down the process, we would go do an, an impact study on, on our chosen site. Great. Thank you for that. Um, this is and going back to, I see a couple of questions that are around uh, looking at the population um, that either is at the current facility or would be at the new facility. And it's what is the number comparison between the um, rehab reintegration unit and the incarceration unit cells? So I think this might be an Al question, um, but I don't know, Amanda, if you want to share from main perspective as well. Happy to have both of you. Al, do you want to get us started? Sure. Um, so with, with the new facility, we, we have it broken down. Like, um, the, the proposal as it sits right now is, is 30 beds in the reentry facility, um, and approximately one, one eighteen in the, uh, in the fenced in facility. Um, but those, those beds would be, um, you know, our mental health beds, those would be programmatic beds, those would be a detainee population. And to, to speak to the earlier point about being a, a, a unified system, we, we have no court, no county systems to hold a detainee population. So the, the State Department of Corrections holds both sentenced and um, detained population in the, in the same building. So this would give us a separate detainee area as well to not mix those populations. Um, so there's there's a number of, of of beds broken out and and maybe Tabrina can can speak more to that with the 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 current design of of the proposed new facility. Um, currently, we we have very limited capabilities in providing a programmatic bed or a general population bed. Um, we have to accommodate with a facility that was built basically as a warehouse um, in the '70s for men. 
Um, it was designed as a men's men's facility, regional facility. Um, so we're we're constantly trying to evolve and and better the space that we have, but again, we're we're very limited. So um, something that's a general population unit today could be a programmatic unit tomorrow. Or when when we went through COVID, we had to you know we had quarantine units and isolation units, and so we've we've had to adjust and adapt the current facility based on the, on the layout and and we don't have a set number of program beds and general population beds because we're we're trying to evolve and change and and work with the as as Sabrina just mentioned a 50 year old building that doesn't allow for a lot of flexibility. Yeah, and I could just, you know, speak for me and so our fence facility program was built in 2002. So it's you know, over 20 years old at this point. Um, and there was some short-sightedness um, in building that. There, There's not enough medical, actually there's no medical beds for women. So we have to, you know, like Al said, you know, you, you kind of move around the population to make your needs, to get your needs met. We do have an acuity um, space for those who are, um, you know, dealing with some particular, you know, acuteness, uh, you know, some significant mental health issues at the time, but that's really what, um, what we have. Um, we do also have an aging population, so we have to be very creative in how we're housing them. Um, and, you know, there, again, there was some short-sightedness with the 2002 build. Um, and again, we, we, we have a lot more information now. Um, so we are actually going back and, and retrofitting as we speak. We have several plans to build a uh, medical wing for the women because that didn't exist when they built it in 2002. So um, yeah, those spaces are needed for both men and women and um, they just don't exist right now for the women here in Maine. Thanks, Amanda. Um, not seeing anybody else on that one. Um, so this is kind of, a couple more questions related to the population. Um, I think this is going to be you, Al. I think you did address it in part of your presentation when you were talking about detainees and how um, Department of Corrections really doesn't get to decide who comes, mm -hmm. um, that you are the place. Because it asked, what are the alternatives to jailing women who are not violent and are awaiting trial? If you can speak to that a bit. Yes. Um, so very few options at this point. Um, as I as I did state earlier, the judiciary is responsible for lodging people in our system. So the, the court makes the determination if somebody should be lodged um, and then they are they're They're brought to our facility where we we process them. And um, if they're able to make bail, they make bail. If they're held without bail, they're they're awaiting trial. Um, but those decisions really fall with, within the court. Um, we're just a, a receiving agency, um, in the meantime, while, while they're awaiting trial or, uh, resolution of their, their crime or serving their, their sentence that's been imposed by the court. So, um, there is where the department is starting a new pretrial supervision program, um, that's starting as a pilot program in, in, uh, Essex and Orleans counties in, in January, but that, that will be an option, um, going forward, um, that could potentially have some impact on, on reducing the detainee population within, within the state. But as of right now, there, there are really limited options outside of the, the detention that, again, the court orders, not us. Thanks for that, Al. Anybody else want to speak on that? Before we... If not, Al, it might be you again. Um, it, it says, is there openness on the part of DOC to create more reentry beds than secure incarcerated beds or to equal the number more? It feels like too few reentry beds are being created. Can you speak to that number? Is it open for negotiation? Can it fluctuate? Yeah. Yeah, we're we're certainly open to that discussion, and and we've had internal discussions amongst ourselves and and um, with with BGS as well. Um, you know, we we did a, a pretty comprehensive study with uh, uh, an outside entity, HOK, um, looking at our, our population and population trends within the department, population trends across the state for the for general population, um, and current current bed totals and, and looking at the population on the decline, what we have for a sentence population compared to a detainee population. So we, we've taken all that into account as we initially have said, we're looking at a 30-bed reentry facility, but we're also open to 
looking at that criteria. And, th and that, that criteria for reentry is something that will be developed. We, we work with our, our stakeholder group. Um, that, that we, we meet with on a regular basis made up of, of community members, service providers, legislators. Um, and, and those are things that, that we're talking about. And, and so, yes, I, I mean, the, the, the simple answer is we're, we're certainly open to that, but we've got to balance out the programmatic needs of those that are sentenced and have longer sentences. Um, you know, we're, we're still dealing with a, a court backlog that's quite lengthy, um, we could potentially see an increase in those, those sentence numbers in, in the coming years as that backlog gets gets cleared up. Um, but looking at those numbers and and whether there's there's an opportunity to expand them, we are certainly open to. We we did also we are also designing the reentry facility. The core of that facility is designed to take a thirty bed expansion. So as the program becomes successful, we have the ability to build the living space for 30 beds. The core would already be there. And as Amanda had stated, she started out with 34 beds and then increased over time. And so that's what we intend to do as well. Great, thank you both. Um, to Brina, since I have you on, or I don't know if your spot, if you have your camera on, uh, trying to navigate all the pieces. There's a question here. I don't know if you have the exact answer for the person, but I'm wondering if you might be able to just point the person to when and where this question might be able to get addressed for them. If traffic patterns need to be addressed, like if there's gonna be a new road. I think those are some of the things that community members are like, how is this gonna happen? How's this gonna affect me? And I know we don't have all the answers right now, mm -hmm. but if you can point folks to when and where they might that might come to be, I think that could be helpful. Yes, yeah, so um, we actually did realize we had an incorrect traffic count at the previous planning commission meeting. We actually almost doubled our traffic count, which was very concerning to a few people. We we used the, the total staff number as the shift change. Um, Al actually pointed that out as I was presenting. <laughs> that my number was wrong. So we will have an updated traffic count, uh, expected traffic count at the planning commission on the 24th. Um, and as part of the permitting process, we'll we'll also have to do traffic studies. Great, thank you for that. Let's see, uh, looking through all these questions and trying to um, synthesize one, I see one, which I have heard this question come up before, so I'm gonna ask this here. Uh, maybe this is for both Amanda and um, Al. Uh, it's asking about, um, a parallel model for male prisoners. Is that something that exists in Maine? Is that something that's gonna be looked at in Vermont? Um, you know, we're focusing on a women's facility and reentry facility. Um, folks are asking about parallel. Yeah, so yeah. in Maine, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, just Go ahead. In Maine, we do, we actually had men's reentry centers before we had women's reentry centers. So those processes were already in place for men. Um, they did reopen um, our Washington County uh, Corrections Center um, based on a need um, that we saw in, in Washington County. It had been closed by the previous administration, but the current administration um, heard from the community and said, no, we want them back, which again, speaks to maybe, you know, those who are weary about having a correctional facility in their backyard. Um, it was actually the community and the townspeople that that told their representatives, told our governor, no, we really want this employer and employees um, back in this community because it served us so well. So those processes did already exist for men and we just caught up. So I'll let, I'll take it from there. Yeah. So we don't have a reentry program for, for the men. Um, as far as the, you know, looking forward for, for our current facilities, our newest male facility is 20 years old. Um, that was 2002 as well, 2003 in, in Springfield. Um, and, and that's, that's dated, but we're also looking at that. We've the last, um, four years, we're just finishing up, a um, a program with the urban Institute, the prison research innovation network where we've looked at humanizing the experience within the facility, um, both for the, the population and the staff. Um, so we're looking at these models, we're looking at those those Scandinavian models and, and looking at how we can improve what we have currently. Um, the 10 the year study that I talked about with HOK, the, the women's facility was was the first to be identified um, as as most needing replacement, but we're also looking at, at, um, at Springfield and, and how we can improve the environment there. We've We've recently created an honors unit in, in that facility. Um, 
the uh, the population came together and made a proposal to the the superintendent at the time around cr opening a coffee shop. So the the population runs a it would look like you're going to Starbucks, and it's inside a correctional facility, and it's it's pretty amazing. So it gives these these guys an opportunity to 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 make the coffee, to the the baked goods that that are being sold, um, and and the the staff and the the incarcerated population are able to sit down and drink coffee together if they if they choose to do so. So those are some of the things in in a in a small package that we're looking at as we as we reimagine the Department of Corrections and and part of our strategic planning that's that's currently ongoing. You know, modernization is is one piece of that that strategic plan for us. Um, health and wellness of the population is another piece. Um, a just and equitable system and our staff and staffing is is the fourth um, priority. So these are all things that, that, that we're taking into account as, as we kind of reimagine the Vermont model. And we've, we've talked a lot about the main model, which we've with good intention have have taken from from Amanda and her team a lot of great ideas, but we're also trying to incorporate a lot of that into the Vermont model of corrections as as we imagine reimagine what what corrections should be in in our state. So, Kristen, I saw you went on. Do you have something you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks, and that's a great question. I appreciate um, that being asked. So, in addition to what Al mentioned, the plethora of things that we're working on currently. The legislature did appropriate a small amount of funds to do a feasibility study for a men's reentry facility um, as well. So that is something that we're looking at down the road further and would be partnering uh, certainly with Sabrina on that effort with BGS. Great, thank you for that addition. Um, and I don't know, Kristen, this might be you. I don't know if it's out. There's a bunch of questions here that are around funding for this. Okay. And uh, my understanding of it is, I know it's limited in some ways, like ultimately you are you and BGS are putting out, you know, what, what this is going to cost and it needs to be funded by the legislature and the state. So it's not you making it, but if you could just kind of speak a little bit to the, the budget process for this and where the money comes from, I think that'd be helpful. Sure, and I'll look to Sabrina to fill in any gaps, but it's a it's a slow process. We request like increment amounts um, year by year as the project progresses um, and then to kind of stash away funds. So we're prepared to make those like bigger purchases and start construction and the permitting, um, which in itself is a larger amount than I even realized um, as we started this process. Um, so Sabrina, do you have any deeper insights to that? Sure, and I think Isaac wants to jump in as well. Um, so funding comes from the capital bill, and the capital bill is roughly the same amount every year. And so what we've been doing for the past few years and will continue in the future, it'll, it's probably going to take us about 10 years to build up the funds, is we take a certain amount, which uh, ranges from like um, 10000 to like 25000 over the course of that 10 years, depending on what other state priorities are out there. And we basically just collect that so we can pay as we go with this facility for design and then construction. Yeah, I can I can add to that. Thanks, Karen. Uh, hi, folks. I'm Isaac Gino. I'm the policy director for the Department of Corrections. You know, this uh, process will be long, as I think multiple folks have said on the call tonight, um, and it will involve a lot of coordination with the legislature. Um, the legislature will be driving the funding for the facility, conversations around um, the facility, what it should look like. That will all play out this coming session and in sessions to come. Um, I think notably it'll, it'll probably take place in House Corrections and Institutions, uh, House Judiciary, Senate Institutions, Senate Judiciary, um, as well as the Appropriations Committees um, on both the, the House and Senate side. Um, so as Tabrina mentioned, uh, most of the funding for this will come through the Capitol bill. Um, and it really just depends on the legislative appetite uh, and our bonding capacity as a state. But um, the state has, I think last year, um, the last biennium put about $15.5 million into the bank for this project. Um, and so we'll continue to move forward, hopefully, um, to put that money away. I think just to answer uh, one other question I saw in the chat um, around, uh, you know, other alternatives to incarceration. I think that's a, that's a really great um, question that, that folks had. Um, Last year, the Department of Corrections uh, put $11 million into community-based services here in Vermont, including the community justice centers, which are critical partners um, in the justice space in deflecting people from the criminal justice system through pre-charge referrals um, or uh, on the back end in post-adjudication uh, through reparative boards and the COSA model. 
Um, there's also uh, been a huge push towards transitional housing uh, through the Burlington Housing Authority and Pathways, um, as well as working with all of the contracted providers that are at CRCF today. Um, so for example, the Vermont Network, um, Mercy Connections, LUNS, Kids Apart Program. Uh, and so I think it's so important as we have this conversation to think about how we continue to invest in alternatives to incarceration and community-based programs, um, as well as trying to improve the conditions for the women who currently live at CRCF. Uh, and so I think that's going to be a conversation we continue to have with our legislative partners, um, and that we'll have as well, I think, um, with the town of Essex. I know we have a planning commission public comment coming up in just a couple of weeks. So looking forward to seeing folks there. Um, but clearly this is just the beginning of this longer conversation and really appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Thank you, Isaac. That was a wonderful wrap up. Um, I did want to, I think we've got most of the topics in the questions. Like I said, we are going to save them. So I apologize if I didn't get your question exactly. Right, um, we will use those to inform our um, other future forums or gatherings. Um, I did want to just leave time if any of our panelists would like to share anything, have any closing remarks before I hand it off to Jill to do the final wrap up. So if any of our panelists have anything they wanna say or... Okay, perfect. So I'm going to hand it to Jill to wrap us up and um, end the webinar for us. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I don't know that I have an official wrap up, although I will. Um, one of the questions that was asked was around being able to change the numbers who would be in the reentry uh, unit versus the secure facility. And I can share that I heard from Commissioner Demel in a different forum that that could potentially require legislative action, that it's in statute that determines that the custody level of people who are considered detentioners is um, the reason why they would not be able to be at the reentry center because they're currently designated um, medium custody. So I don't know if Isaac or Al, if you would wanna speak to that at all, but um, the fact that having a larger reentry center might require legislative advocacy, I think is a really key thing to point out to the community. Yeah, thank you, Jill. You're, you're absolutely right there. And I'll defer to Al on some of this as well, but um, that that's correct. Um, so currently in Vermont statute, uh, the Department of Corrections does not have the ability to place a detainee, an individual um, who is waiting trial um, into a minimum security setting like the uh, reentry space would be. Um, that's something I think that's a policy decision for the legislature. Um, and so I think that's going to be a conversation again that we see play out in the state house um, this coming year. Uh, so we'll, we'll leave it to our legislative partners to, to work through that. Al, I don't know if you have any uh, additional no, comments on that. You got it. But that, you know, and to that point, that's what's kind of driving that that 30 number. But I think Sabrina also mentioned, um, we're trying to build this in a, in a flexible way. So if there is opportunity in the future, if that statute is changed, uh, either, you know, coming years or, or many years from now, we're hoping that we can make sure that that reentry space has expansion capacity. Um, so if needed, you know, we can spin that up. Yeah, that's great. I thought it was important. I've, I've, I'm forever impressed since I moved to the Essex community how thoughtful folks are and um, forward thinking in terms of, you know, some of the questions that were asked tonight. But so thank you again for coming. We, the Community Justice Center is here and we'll be staying connected to this um, potential project and we'll be keeping you up to date. If there are gonna be future forums, we'll look over the questions that got raised and see if there are any that got missed. Um, we'll see what happens at the meeting on the 24th and um, just keep paying attention to it and we'll be responsive. Feel free to email the Community Justice Center in the interim, either Karen or I, we're on our website. And um, thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>